On today's Road of His Overtime, we are going to talk about two running backs that you really should be looking to get on those rosters. We're going to give a case for each of those and, and just how good could they be in 2023. We always hear the term league winners. I'm throwing up the quotation marks. These guys really, I think, fit the bill. And, and Sean has written about both of them up on rotaviz.com. He has given one of them the tag of potentially the next Jamal charge. So I'm sure people are excited to hear who we're going to talk about from that perspective. Sean, as we kick off today's show, I meant to do this on the Monday episode when we did our Best Ball Mania draft. But as we jumped into that, and we had to get ready to get on the clock. We didn't do it. I want to give a shout out to Curtis, Patrick, and Dave Cabin, who do the road of his flagship fantasy football podcast a fantastic show they also have three episodes a week like we do here at ot they hit their 300th episode as a combined team so i want to give them a shout out they're a major part obviously sean of the road of his site team dave with a big part in the tools we all know curtis being the dynasty commander so massive shout out to those guys and if you haven't already listened into their show I would highly encourage you to do so, along with the other fantastic shows that we have throughout the Road of His Radio Podcast Network. Sean mentioned on that draft that uh, one of the flashbacks or throwbacks that you were doing was from, I remember, that game episode with Thomas Emmerich. So they have some very fun shows. I've done one, a Packers show. Sean's done a Chiefs-related show, so check those out as well. But lots of great content up there. When you're there as well, drop a written review. We'd really appreciate that. Hit the subscribe button as we continue to grow the Road of His Radio Podcast Network. So shout out to both of those guys, Sean. I think a very, very big part of the team here. Yeah, love what Dave and Curtis have been doing, and you're going to get some great work from them on the site in August as well. Look for those emails from Curtis that will help keep you updated with all of our content coming out, along with some of his own notes on how to play different formats. And we know Curtis has been very successful across formats over the last handful of seasons subscribe over there as well to get those notifications so column today we are going to talk about a couple of you know real potential star running backs for the 2023 season we think about the early guys and how it's a little bit weaker up there up top it can be easy for me to think about how the fantasy community is embracing you know, elements of zero RB, certainly at least embracing elements of a wide receiver heavy draft. We know that best ball drafting has really changed a lot of minds and underlined the need for those wide receivers. But at the same time, one of the things that's happening is you're perhaps not getting the full number of running backs at the top, or you're not getting that right profile at the top to really convince drafters, I'm going to go ahead and pull the trigger on running backs in the way that I might have in the past. The flip side of that is you do get these profiles in the middle rounds that are very, very interesting. You mentioned the next Jamal Charles. Really, the title for that article was Echoes of Charles. No one's going to be the next Jamal Charles. I did put the next Tony Pollard on the other guy. I think that that's a very reasonable. Yeah, I mean, that's a more (laughs) reasonable standard to hit there. Colin, we got a lot of cool articles coming out on the site. The team has been really cranking away there. New pieces from Neil Dutton, from Bjorn, who I'm doing the Dynasty Draft with. He also has some great best ball content out for you. Obviously, Conor O'Driscoll is keeping you updated on how you need to win the FFPC best ball tournaments in his series. And coming from Conor, I mean, he's the authority there. You want to make sure you check that out. But I've had a couple of pieces up recently. The best pick in the first five rounds in FFPC redraft league. So if you're looking at redraft, that's one to check out. And then on Monday, the five wide receivers that are targeting everywhere and are generating some crazy training camp buzz. Again, if you're wanting to get a sense of who we're targeting, who we're drafting in the actual events, those pieces are up there for you. But today we're going to talk about a couple of running backs. And let's start with the guy who is a little bit less expensive in James Cook. Yeah, so you mentioned the Tony Pollard potential comparison. That is based around James Cook. And you you mentioned some of the differences in the landscape and something we've talked a lot about, but it is very, very interesting in the draft rooms this year to be able to see how we can put some of these teams together and how the profile of the running back throughout those rounds, kind of four through eight range, has really changed to players that we would generally like to target we've kind of seen some of the players that we would target more often who would have been say nine ten round picks moving up a little bit and the picks that would have been in rounds two three moving down a little bit i think as people adjust to 
the types of players that should really be drafted in those zones. But when we look at this potential option, we have talked about Cook, we've drafted Cook. We haven't really dived into a lot of the details. Obviously, is with the Buffalo Bills, one of the best offenses in the entire NFL. The other part of the Buffalo Bills, Sean, we have been, well, I, I know I have been chasing that offense for a number of years, you know, with Singletary, for example, was was my guy for quite some time. Uh, they have had a number of running backs go through, and it hasn't really, outside of the stretch where, where Singletary uh, two seasons ago really heated up for those last six or seven games, there hasn't been a consistent run really for the Buffalo Bills running backs. But James Cook's profile and, and everything that goes along with that, and there has been some very positive reports as well coming out of camp. Has the competition there from Damian Harris? Do you think that, you know, we, we look sometimes at uh, Russian quarterbacks and how that sometimes is negative for the receiving back to be able to get those receptions, for example. Is James Cook's profile to be that three down back to give us everything we want in Buffalo? Are we going to, you know, continue to chase that for many years, and maybe it doesn't come to fruition based on how maybe we see Josh Allen playing around the goal line, get those rushing touchdowns, and take it away from the the running back, for example? There is those question marks, but when you put the whole kind of list of ingredients together, he is somebody who the upside is is just huge, and I think people probably, if they're against him, they've probably bought into the Buffalo running backs haven't really delivered as much as we wanted over the course of Josh Allen's career. And I think that you could probably also throw in that James Cook was probably a little bit of a reach in the reality draft. Maybe there were some other directions they could have gone there, but they did select him. They do almost certainly like him. One of the things I did in the article here is create a very simple screener projection where we're using draft slot games rushing EP, rushing points over expectation, and then rookie EP to spit out some very simple numbers for the upcoming season, looking at these guys in terms of points per game. And the one thing that I think really pops out here is that despite being dramatically outscored by Damian Pierce, as those guys are rookies, that when you include the draft component and you include the rushing efficiency component, that Cook actually projects better for 2023. Now, that's not to say that we should take that and say, I mean, Cook deserves to be ranked ahead of him. There are other things going on there. The point of that exercise is to sort of calibrate our expectations based on what the last 10 years have told us. And so that screener projection is based off the running back sample from that time period. When we look at some of the other things that Cook did in his relatively limited sample, and he has 89 carries there as a rookie his balance in the running game is very very impressive i talked at length on the show and certainly have gone through the details of this on the site in the way that i really like these guys who have elite yards before contact numbers and elite yards after contact numbers and especially if you can get that from a little bit of a smaller guy and tony pollard is not a small back per se he's not a big back more of the medium size you're going to get cook coming in there around 200 pounds smaller than a Pollard, but yet you have three yards before contact last year. You have 2.7 after. I think the part that people will be really surprised by is probably the after contact numbers because you know that the Buffalo offense is generating some very light boxes. You're going to be running into favorable fronts. So maybe the yards before contact don't impress you, but they do count. They are important. And when you can get cleanly through the first level, it sets that back up to be very dynamic at the second level, which when you're talking about someone with James Cook's athleticism, with his explosiveness, that's exactly what you're looking for there, right? So you want a guy who can take advantage of it. A lot of NFL backs cannot. And so you love that from Cook. And then you have the 9% broken tackle and 7% forced missed tackle. So again, a very good balance in terms of the way that he is making defenders miss better numbers than tony pollard had before his big breakout season going from 2021 into 2022 where he firmly kind of puts the ezekiel elliott situation to bed the thing that we saw from pollard last season is that he had been so dynamic coming in and then as camp progressed and it became clear that he was their best runner he went screaming up draft boards despite the fact that elliott was sitting there in the way 
one of the arguments that I have here for Cook is that we don't really have that impediment. And so if the Bills do make some of these changes that they have discussed, the sky really is the limit. So then you look at what's going on in training camp, and we want to take some of these things with a grain of salt. We know that teams are going to try things out early on, and then in many cases, they're going to go back to what their team identity is. When they're in the fourth quarter and they're trying to win these games, do we expect Josh Allen to dump the ball off to James Cook, or do we expect him to extend the play when the play isn't there to run it himself? When they're down by the goal line, what do we anticipate him doing? So I think that you always have that risk. But as you mentioned, you have that hot streak from Devin Singletary to finish the 2021 season. And right now, it looks like things are setting up for Cook to have that kind of role, plus probably more receiving. And so if we have those pieces, and one of the things that, again, talk about here in the article, is it was surprising last year to see Singletary run so many more routes when Cook was so much more effective in terms of generating targets on his routes in terms of generating yards on his routes cook actually fits up there in this category with mccaffrey eckler swift i mean those are the names that you want to be with as a receiver in terms of per route efficiency the thing that you actually want is just a lot more routes for that guy well again that's that year one to year two element where you're expecting to see that jump and when you follow what's happening in training camp and they're saying james cook is very involved as a receiver which again, just that is encouraging from the perspective of how is this Bills offense going to work, but then not just involved, but making highlight plays consistently. That's the other piece. So, I mean, we can have this sort of mild skepticism about his talent kind of stretching back to college. I mean, he's probably not Dalvin Cook, right? You can also have this mild skepticism about how the Bills are going to use him. You can also have maybe a little bit of concern that if Damian Harris gets hot, that he could become, I mean, not Jamal Williams, because again, the Bills are not going to give a running back that many touches around the goal line, but you know, maybe the Bills version of it, where suddenly you have a different back who is stealing all of these really important touches. So there are risks. There are risks that make sense to consider and to wait as you're drafting. But when I'm looking at it and also go through ADP and, and how to play this in different formats in the article. But I mean, there's still a, a, you know, a 10 to 15 spot gap from where he's going to where I think just like a median type of outcome would be. So if you're getting a full round to round and a half discount of where a guy's most likely outcome is, and you're not even having to pay then for the ceiling outcome, and we talk all the time about we want to draft guys who do have ceiling outcomes that are interesting. And as you mentioned at the start, I don't have any problem not putting quotes around. I think league winner, right? So when we look at that and we look at the prices, you definitely want to make sure that your James Cook shares are at least reasonable. I don't think that you want to be empty there. Yeah, I, I would agree very, very much. So, and if the targets come with it, the no, no, no real role. Uh, maybe. Damian Harris can be seen as a roadblock as well, you know, having him added in there. But I think there's a, enough for both of these guys. And I think with Cook, I think he he's going to get the first crack at who is the, the starting running back and get the additional volume included in that. And with what has happened so far in training camp and with how we expect this offense to be so explosive, that is very, very exciting. And as you mentioned, the, the discount of where he's going, I, I do think we'll see him start to, and he has kind of started to rise slightly, but it hasn't been anything significant i don't think they'll put you off drafting him and uh, i do think we'll see a move up over the coming weeks sean the other player that we're going to jump into now is and and we we kind of hinted at talking about these when we were doing our draft again so to circle back to that if you didn't listen to the the bbm4 draft that we did this past week uh, on monday we did dive into some running back selections and that drafted a little bit differently than we have over the recent drafts and a, a real uh, fun team i think sean i think you know the the, the recap we did during it uh, made me even more excited about it. So check that one out. But somebody we did draft, and that was Travis Etienne. He is the person, Sean, that you have, we'll say in quotation marks, have compared to the next Jamal Charles. This is the quotation marks episode as we move through here. But you do say, as one of the headlines, the closest thing to Jamal Charles since the goat retired, question mark? 
Yes or no? <laughs> is he? Is he? Well, you're the man putting the case forward for it, uh, so so let's go. Colin, I believe we've talked a little bit early. Colin, I believe we've talked a little bit earlier in the off season about Travis Etienne and this comparison to Bijan Robinson, where Robinson had more peak scrimmage yards per game but you have massive seasons from both guys and ETN actually a full additional yard after contact per attempt. Right. So again, we're talking about a guy who is a really is a small back and I mean, he weighs more in that Pollard range that we discussed, but I mean, you're still on the small back end of this and yet has these crazy numbers in terms of after contact and in terms of overall evasion. So one of the things with Bijan is that when he comes in with that 32% evasion rate, people are thinking, okay, you've got a big back. Maybe you don't have the full long speed that you get with a Brees Hall or a Jonathan Taylor, but you get a big back with incredible lateral agility and the ability to punish guys. And then is an elite receiver. So you look at his peak yards per route and you're at 2.4. And you're thinking, I mean, again, for a guy of that size and overall capability, Robinson looks like you know, almost a unicorn. And then you look at ETN and he's at 3.5, right? So we're talking about an additional yard after contact per attempt, an additional full yard per route, again, in the peak season. I mean, that's how good ETN was as a college player. Well, then, I mean, we've now seen him on the NFL field, so we don't need to just talk about him as a collegian. We can look at this and say, okay, last season, his 12.7% broken tackle rate slid in right between Josh Jacobs and Derrick Henry. Like right between Josh Jacobs and Derrick Henry. And then you look at his yards before contact and it's tied with Miles Sanders and Khalil Herbert for the NFL lead. That's a minimum of 100 carries. There are some guys who get in there in that 75 to 100 range who are even much more explosive. We just talked about one in terms of James Cook and the yards before contact there. But when you're talking about, again, that balance of the profile and a player being able to do multiple things with the long speed, you're starting to get to this point where, I mean, again, no one's going to be Jamal Charles, but you start to get that sensation when you watch him play. And one of the bold predictions that I made after the first preseason game last year was that we were going to see this from ETN because he appeared to be on a completely different speed out there than everybody else. I mean, he looked like he's in video game speed where, I mean, the rest of the people are in reality, you know, you kind of, I imagine myself out there and you've got a little character that like the connection to your controller doesn't work, just like won't move at all. When you have ETN and then you have that gap to NFL players and then you have that gap to a theoretical Sean Siegel, I mean, you want that guy who's gapping those NFL players, right? So we think about that. And then the thing that's been interesting, I think, is how this whole offseason has transpired, where the Jaguars have been insistent that Tank Bigsby is good. Tank Bigsby is going to give us a second true starter. Tank Bigsby is going to take a lot of the work off of ETN's plate so that we don't have to worry about him you know, getting worn out, getting overexposed, having that additional risk of injury, all of those types of things. And so you're thinking, okay, well, they're just not going to give him a chance to be Jamal Charles. And then they come out with this quote last week where they're saying, I mean, he's improving. He's going to potentially hit 16, 1700 yards as a rusher. And then the thoughts are, well, I mean, are we getting information that makes any sense or matters at all? Because 1700 yards rushing would be a season that you cannot get to if Tank Bigsby is very involved in this offense. There's mixed messages so, there, Sean. There's mixed messages. Yeah. The, the other thing I was going to mention, you know, to, to enter up there, obviously he comes out in his rookie season and, and doesn't play. He's injured the, the entire year after the Jacksonville Jaguars select him. Comes in last year, and I, I've talked about, you know, the recovery from injuries on a few of these shows recently. You know, J.K. Dobbins and him were kind of in a similar both last year um and Dobbins struggled a lot more than we we've seen with ETN. ETN plays all 17 games last year 220 rush attempts between receiving and rushing is over 1400 combined scrimmage yards you know with that no receiving touchdowns but does have five rushing touchdowns somebody going into their 
uh, third year in the league. Uh, the team has invested quite a bit in him. Where his ADP is and where the trajectory is, uh, you mentioned there about the team even saying about you know not letting him get worn down. That makes sense for all running backs, but it feels to me like ETN has almost this little, a tag around him because of missing his rookie season through injury that he maybe isn't capable of living up to the, the physicality of an NFL season. And all running backs are subject to potential injuries, but we've seen last year that that really isn't the case. And it feels like where his ADP is now, if we're looking at a player who missed one full season, basically last year's his rookie year, potentially taking that step forward this year, that his ADP sliding down draft boards kind of at the minute, if we look at underdog ADP from May, June, July, August, it has continued to decline every month. It is only in the range of 10 picks over that time, but it feels like he has been discounted for every potential reason possible and, the upside again, like we talked with Cook, you know, hasn't been priced into the scenario at all. It really doesn't seem to be. And it also seems to be the situation where the coaching staff doesn't perhaps realize what they have in part because he makes it look so easy and he's so good. I mean, this quote that they have here column is insane right it says one of the things that we looked at in his game this offseason we noticed him just attacking the hole downhill attack the line of scrimmage finding that crease where a lot of times you'll see him try to bounce we were able to show him and really emphasize shoulder squared anticipating where the hole could be and just trusting that he's bought into it he sees it we've been able to show it to him that's the next step for him i mean it was his rookie year you don't just hand a guy a ball and let him go run sometimes that happens but that skill and ability to anticipate a hole we always talk about speed through the hole not to the whole type of thing. He's really embraced that in training camp. Well, again, we're talking about a guy who tied for the league lead in yards before contact. So anticipating the whole, at least from that perspective, and when you contrast it with other backs, wasn't an issue. One of the cool things you can do with the advanced stat explorer, I don't think there's really any value to this per se. It's more or less just interesting. But when you have a quote like this, you can pull up the advanced stat explorer on road of is there we have the great numbers from sports info solutions and you can look at the de design gap percentage and so you've got nick chubb and aaron jones up there at 71 percent then alvin Kamara, christian mccaffrey travis Etienne in that 69 68 68 range below them you have derrick henry josh jacobs austin eckler jonathan taylor at 64 62 62 and 60 like a big gap down now obviously i've not included a ton of backs who are less relevant, less interesting, but just looking at stars here and how often they were hitting the design gap last season. I mean, if you're right there with Alvin Kamara and Christian McCaffrey, again, it's going to be hard to spin what you did in your first season in the NFL as a weakness. If the team legitimately thinks that he's going to make a big jump in that area, then I mean, we, again, we get those Jamal Charles echoes, right? When the Chiefs would hand the ball off to Jamal Charles, he would take it. He would slash into the line. There would not be a hole. You would see him disappear. You would see him come out the other side. And then you would see him run for another seven yards. And he would do it over and over. You get six yards, eight yards, 13 yards, five yards, seven yards. And at the end of the season, Jamal Charles has this age 24 season where he rushes for 1,467 yards on 230 carries, generates 1,935 yards from scrimmage. Again, we're hoping that ETN can get that sort of 450-ish receiving yards to really round it out. But to get where he got, Charles was at 6.4 yards per attempt on 230 carries. And when you're thinking about guys who could legitimately do that in the 2023 season, I mean, you're mostly just thinking about Jonathan Taylor if he's healthy and that Indianapolis offense works. You're thinking about Brees Hall if he's healthy and the Aaron Rodgers offense works. You're thinking about J.K. Dobbins if he ends his hold in. And you're thinking about Travis Etienne. I mean, those are the guys. And obviously, they're probably not going to hit that number. It's an extreme number. But Dobbins has been up in that range before right? Getting up toward the six yards per carry, even though Dobbins NFL career has sadly been ruined more or less by injuries. We're talking about maybe five guys, maybe 
ETN taking that step and yet being valued in the fourth round. Colm, you and I were in that draft yesterday. He got within one pick of our slot where we had the 108. So we're coming back. We have the 205. Coming back, we have the 405. For him to get to 404, again, that, that doesn't make sense. That's not where he should be in these drafts. Be aware of the risk. Be aware of Tank Bigsby. Obviously, Travis Etienne could get hurt, maybe a little bit more likely to get hurt than the normal running back. And yet, I mean, you're getting this crazy discount where Travis Etienne should be in that area that you're seeing a Derrick Henry, a Ramondre Stevenson. He's a 2-3 turn guy who's being valued in the early fourth. You want to have some exposure. The other part, Sean, that you mentioned, and it is, we always talk about, you know, looking at the coach, listening to what the coaches are saying, trying to decipher what to take away, what to maybe say is, is coach speaking. Sometimes with somebody coming in like a Tanks, Big, Tanks Bigsby, the, there is a chance that the coaches are also trying to pep up, you know, put a pep in a step, give them that bit of confidence. Maybe things aren't going as well as, as people are saying. But if we look at that depth chart, it's Tanks Bigsby is the clear backup there. Jamichael Hasty, Dearness Johnson has come over as a, a free agent from Cleveland. Somebody who I still like, but I don't think he's really going to have a huge impact in this backfield at the start. Anyway, Snoop Connor, Quandre Allison. So, yeah, there's going to be a even, even if we see Tank Bigsby come in and, and have some work here, there's a, there's a lot of that pie left for for Etienne, and I'm I'm excited for his season this year. I'm quite excited for the Jacksonville Jaguars season as well. There's somebody who have a a bit of a soft spot for they, they've been trail true a lot so we'll see how they go in 2023 a fun topic sean to finish up with here a question that comes in from thomas really about do you want players who are going to have volume or targets versus players with bounce back potential so he said he had a question for you and sean at our earliest convenience so this was the earliest convenience thanks thomas uh when it comes to wide receivers would you rather take a player with more target opportunity he mentions here some options like Chris Godwin or Tyler Lockett are a bounce back player in a subsequent year. So Deontay Johnson or Terry McLaurin, there's potential options there. He said, what's the better play in high stakes leagues? Last year targets, last year's targets are opportunity to bounce back this season. And Sean, I think a lot of our approach is the same, regardless of the you know stakes involved in terms of the, the strategy. Unless you want to differentiate that, I think we'll take it as a, a whole for that question. I do think the players mentioned as well, there's different profiles like Godwin and Lockett, for example. Very excited for Lock- Godwin this year, not as excited for Lockett. And, and with Godwin, lots of questions over the last 24 hours around the depth chart and Tampa and who is the quarterback one there. Sean, how do you feel about target opportunity versus bounce back players? So it's not a, essentially a player that we see ascending up. It's a player who maybe didn't achieve what we thought could happen the previous year and and bouncing back from that? This is a great question. And I think also a nuanced question that's a lot of fun. And one of the things here is that, you know, what is the bounce back that you're kind of looking for? Because I think the strongest argument for Deontay Johnson and Terry McLaurin, who are mentioned as bounce back players, is simply the overall volume that you're looking at, right? I mean, you're going to get a lot of targets with Deontay Johnson. You're going to get a lot of targets with elite air yards potential from Terry McLaurin. And certainly if Sam Howell is able to deliver on his deep ball capability, that's one of the refrains that we're really hearing out of commander's camp is that his ability to throw deep is going to unlock this. these guys. It's going to make Terry McLaurin finally able to show off that vertical prowess that has always been reflected in his profile and yet never fully manifests as you know points as actual fantasy scoring because he's played with such poor quarterbacks over that time period you look at players like a chris godwin or tyler lockett i don't know that lockett is a target opportunity guy and when he, we think he feels about like he him, could get squeezed from all sides. So he's a player that Ben and I talked about on our most recent episode of Stealing Bananas, the Tuesday episode, I should say. And I think that 
part of what we discussed there is pretty interesting in terms of Lockett being a player who maintained his targets per route last season, but still below a DK Metcalf, and yet the air yards per target. So, you know, that component that is reliant on your target depth really cratered. And so we're having a reduced overall volume profile for a Tyler Lockett to where you have risk that's just inherent now in how he works within their current offense and with a Geno Smith that then is amplified by his age and the potential for a guy to hit a cliff. I'm not saying I think he's going to do that. I think Tyler Lockett's still a very good player, but you have that risk that you have to be aware of. And then you have JSN coming in and putting a huge dent in the targets for both Metcalf and Lockett, which I think makes both of those guys pretty substantially overvalued. Chris Godwin, really interesting because the target opportunity for him is almost certainly going to be there. You look at how that team is built, even without a Tom Brady, they project to be one of the highest volume passing teams in the NFL. Now, are there scenarios where that doesn't happen and you run into some overall target risk where they really go into a shell? They say Baker Mayfield can't play. Kyle Trask can't play. We can't throw the ball. But the Buccaneers also have terrible running backs and they don't have a team that is going to be able to sit on the ball and succeed. So unless you go into a full-blown tank, then Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, the target opportunity there is extreme. And so then I think we're looking at, okay, Chris Godwin versus Deontay Johnson. Who's the better player? Who is in a cleaner spot from an overall career trajectory perspective? What Godwin was able to do, even though there are some warts in his profile from last season, because you have so many basic wide receiver screens from Brady, where Brady doesn't want to get it, he's going to get rid of the ball almost instantly. That makes Godwin's profile not look as dynamic. But when you think about Chris Godwin, a former number two overall wide receiver in fantasy, and how that could... I mean, he's not going to be wide receiver two this season. But when you look at the entire range of outcomes for him, when you think about what he did last season, where in his own description, he was far, far less than 100%. I think that we have a talent gap between Chris Godwin and Deontay Johnson that gets magnified when we think of the target opportunity that's likely to be there. Now, I'm a pretty big believer in the Pittsburgh Steelers passing offense. You kind of follow what's going on there. And it sounds like George Pickens has been so good that they're a little bit less worried about Kenny Pickett in year two, that with Johnson, with Pickens, they feel like he's going to emerge. They're going to throw the ball pretty decently. But we do know that they have this instinct to go back to a little bit more of a run-oriented offense. When we get down to the brass tacks or the most fundamental underlying points, you have Deontay Johnson as a top five guy in terms of overall wide receiver targets over the last three seasons his efficiency has to stay extremely low to not make him a really strong pick and yet he does have a young teammate who is set there to take a lot of that volume away and so when we're thinking about bounce backs you think to Blair Andrews research where one of the things that he is suggesting is that guys mostly don't bounce back now The better a player is and the younger the player is when they have a down season, the more likely they are to bounce back. So the research and the evidence follows what would be intuitive there. But you do have an issue where when a player is extremely inefficient, that is actually bad. And people tend to think, okay, well, efficiency just bounces around all over the place. And so it doesn't really matter if a player is less efficient. Blair has the bounce back article that pushes back against that. He has a recent article talking about the metrics that are the most exploitable for future fantasy scoring. How do you beat ADP? And one of the things, again, that he's found is that efficiency is actually the way to find it. Like you don't want to fade efficiency. Then you're going to be drafting guys who are on the wrong side of this ADP versus fantasy scoring equation you're not necessarily going to be on the wrong side of it by a mile or anything like that but we want to be seeding our team with guys who can beat expectations who can beat adp 
in small ways for veterans and in large ways for these players who have you know much more uncertain outcomes because they're not proven yet. So I guess one of the things that I would be thinking here is that in terms of these four guys, I don't think any of them actually fit our perfect type of pick or the profile that we're really trying to get high exposure to. But I do think that Deontay Johnson is an interesting guy in terms of both bounce back and, but more importantly, volume. And then Terry McLaurin, somebody whose volume is always underpriced because of quarterbacks. And then Chris Godwin, someone whose target opportunity just seems wildly mispriced. Colin, you and I don't go in for target volume as being the thing that we emphasize, but when you're talking about a guy, the talent level of a Chris yeah. Godwin, when you, who, get the ta- when you get the talent plus the target volume, it makes absolutely no sense. I would agree. I don't really have a huge, I really don't. Sean has summarized that perfectly. And I think it is that kind of crossroads where you're looking for the profile and the opportunity rather than like, if there's a player who maybe some things didn't work out last year and you still like the profile, still like the way things may go. You know, I was looking through some ADP and I felt like maybe trail on Borks fits that, but it's not really a bounce back because he's just been drafted and maybe he hasn't started that ascension yet. So the work that Blair has done, I think the bounce back one is, less likely to happen than is likely to happen for the majority of these nfl players so i think the not just the target opportunity but the opportunity crossed with the the profile and godwin really stands out and this list as one uh deontay johnson then would be the next in my list and i was a big terry mclaurin uh, fan coming you know out uh, really had an instant impact in the nfl um i still think there's a lot left in the tank but in terms of players and that adp range that i'm targeting I'm much more likely to go with with Dodson there, but we're still Sean. We are excited about about Sam Howell, <laughs> so we're always tempering those expectations. But that is going to do it for this episode. A lot of fun talking through the running back options. Very good question there. Thanks for sending that one in, Thomas. If you have any questions you would like us to, you know, talk about on some of these upcoming episodes, send them our way on Twitter at over Tim Ireland or email them across at rotavisradio at gmail dot com. If you are signing up over at rotaviz.com as well, you get access to the content and the tools. The articles we talked about today will be linked in today's show notes, so you can check those out. But you can get a 10% discount with the promo code RVRADIO2023 at checkout. That will get you access to everything up on the website. Rankings, ADP, the tools help you draft. Perfect time to sign up now as we enter full-on draft season. My name is Colin Kelly. You can follow me on Twitter at over to Marlin. My co-host is Sean Siegel. Check out his work, as I mentioned, up on rotaviz.com. And until we are back, have a good one.